Okay, so tonight's Shibur mm -hmm. is dedicated to the Aliyah Neshama of Gitul Bat Shemuel, and it's sponsored by Tehillah Brooks in memory of her mother, Dina, Bat Shaya, and Chaya. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Thank you. <coughs> you know, it's so interesting. Uh, the time passes so quick. You know, I just remember I was here just a couple of months ago, and now I'm sitting here again, just a couple months later, you know? Ah, so, uh, <coughs> I really, I really feel the passage of time, uh, you know, when I come to Eretz Yisrael. Tonight is a really a very interesting shear. Uh, it's very fundamental. Because what I want to do tonight is go into what exactly is what's called the game plan. What exactly is really going on? And this is basically a framework kind of shear although I go into many details. And <clears throat> what it does is it reveals the essential uh, task of man, and in many ways it indicates to us what does God really want? What's the bottom line? You know? uh, and then when you have an understanding of that, you begin to realize that everything you see ultimately is supposed to bring man Mankind, especially the Jewish people, to this destination. It's really what it is. And, and it, it, is, it is so fundamental that it really addresses and uh, is manifested in so many different things. And I'm, I'm going to try to flesh out the framework itself, you know. Um, and then as time goes on, you will be able to understand a great deal of Chazal based on this. Everything obviously begins with a very important question. Who is God, really? Who is He? It's the most fundamental question of all. It's amazing to think, how often do we stop and ask ourselves, who is this being that created everything, the entire creation, you know, that is responsible for all the events of mankind, responsible for all the suffering of mankind, Ultimately, that's, he's the one that does it, and so on. He's the one who's responsible for the uh, successes and failures of every individual. He's the one, you know. He's the one we pray to three times a day. You know, so one would think that you'd have a real curious thought about who is this entity, and so on. Well, there are certain things that we know because he's revealed them to us. Other than that, we would never know. Um, but there's, uh, among the things that he's revealed, <clears throat> and there are many things, there is what's called the greatest essential principle of all, among all the revelations of who God is. What is that? And that is the concept of oneness. And God prides himself on that. We see it says, Shema Israel, hear O Israel. Hashem Lokeinu, the God, our God. Hashem Echad, God is one. We, and we have to say this twice a day. That clearly is the essential idea that God represents to us. And he wants us to know that. Very important idea. It was, <clears throat> of all the characteristics that you could say about God, right? He's a racham, he's compassionate, he's long-suffering, erech apayim, he has tremendous graciousness. There's so many things you can say about God, okay? But the one thing that he clearly prides himself, if you can use that word, but the one thing that he clearly wants us to know to such an extent that we have to say it twice a day, you see, is echot, that he's one. Very important idea. Uh, this this attribute of what he has. 
But the concept of Echod, there are many different ideas about Echod, about oneness, even though it seems simple. But it's not really simple at all. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the ideas of that. I have a specific shear. Uh, it's called Who is God? And I think it's on the internet. I think it's uh, among the children, you know, where I dwell uh, very importantly in the totality of the concept of oneness, what that is. And it's astounding what it really is. Here, however, because I'm addressing a different theme about what does God want for man, there are three different concepts of oneness that is critical to understand. <clears throat> and that's really how you, be, how, where you, the, you, you begin to understand the task that man has. <clears throat> there are three types of oneness uh, that is very important. One, Yichud Mitzi that God is the only thing that exists really, and everything else emanates from Him. Period. That's it. He's the only thing that has what's called true existence, whatever that is, and nobody knows what that is. That means He is in whatever context you can understand. <clears throat> right? Everybody else ain't. If I may use the proper term. What does that mean? That means in order for us to exist, we have to emanate from him. We have to sort of like borrow into his existence. And he gives us that existence, you see? And in that sense, uh, we are part of him, in what, whatever that means, and so on, uh, and so on. In any case, so Yichut Mitzvah means that he's the only thing that has this quality called being, existence. Everything else doesn't, it must, borrow or use his existence in order to be. And the idea is that even after we exist, because we now take, so to speak, from his existence, don't think that you exist the way he does. Don't even think like that, you see. Because he has to think about us from nanosecond to nanosecond. If somebody ever distracted him, right? and all of a sudden he stopped thinking about us, we would instantly vanish, you see. So we don't even have the wherewithal to continue to exist. He's got to constantly say to us, be, be. It's astounding when you think about that. We do not have the capacity to exist even after we have been created. Okay, now, so Yichud Mitzu, so it simply means, is that he's the only one that really exists. He has whatever that is. And the truth is, which I mentioned in another show, it's always an interesting question. If I asked you, does God have existence? What would you answer? Right? How many people say he has existence? Raise your hand. If you don't define say it. Define existence. Where, well, existence yeah. means being. We know what it means. We exist, we be. We, we, we is. Right? Um, and the answer to that is very interesting. God doesn't have existence. He is existence. It's a difference. That's his essence. His essence is being itself. Whatever that means. You see, we have an essence, all kinds of characteristics, and we have existence that gives rise to that essence. You see. However, his essence is being itself. Now, we don't know what that means. We can understand it from a certain point of view, but we certainly cannot in any way really comprehend what that is. But that's really what he is. He is existence per se. <clears throat> in any case, that's what Yichud Mitzvah means. He's the only thing that is. That's number one. Therefore, since he's the only thing that is, he's the only force in creation. He's the only force. That's called Yichud Shlitasoy. He is the only force cause in existence. He's the only thing that, he's the only being that can do anything. We can do nothing. When we think we do something, it's because he is doing it for us, and we are under the illusion that we are doing that. So that's the concept of Yichud Shli Tosoy, that he is the ultimate force of, be, of, of anything. He's the only cause. And of course, you can go into this in much greater depth, but. I'm just, you know, uh, trying to 
you know, just basically describe it. Uh, then there's another Yichud. So we have Yichud Metziusai, you know, is the only one that really exists. Then there's Yichud Shlitasai, he's the only one that is a cause, a force, you see. Like the Ramchal says, Ein koyach acher. There is no other force. There's nothing. And that's, that has tremendous, uh, what do you call it, um, um, a depth to it, you know. I'll give you one of them, and in a certain way, it's good to know. Let's assume a person has, uh, a person has, let's say, pneumonia, right? Uh, so we look at it. Hey, he's got pneumonia. What does that mean? He's got a whole bunch of bacteria, right, that's making a nest, a home, in his lungs. It's usually what pneumonia is, right? Okay. <clears throat> but that's a mistake in thinking. Because not only is there no such thing really as bacteria, but they can't do anything. The force that you're looking at, the bacteria itself, is God. There's no such thing as bacteria causing you distress. It is God causing you distress. Except right now, he looks like a bacteria. You see, it's a very important concept. Uh, because that Yichud Shitosa is, there is no individual force other than God. Nothing. You see. And therefore, if a person has some type of disease, or if he's all of a sudden confronted with a dangerous person, if you think that, if you look at the, you know, whatever, the, the, the danger, and you say, there is no danger that can harm me. This is God, except he looks like the enemy in that sense, because that's how he conceals himself. So Rabbi Chaim Voloshin says, it is good to know, Bodeke Minusa, he says Bodeke Minusa means this has been tried and tested, that it works. If you're Mechavan, if you think about the fact that whatever is ailing you, it doesn't make a difference, that really they are zero, they have no force, it's really God behind them, allowing them to do whatever they want to do, you see, then according to Rabbi Chaim Voloshin, it will disappear. It's an interesting segula, you know, for any kind of, uh, especially disease and so on, you know. It, and it works. It, it, it really works. Um, I've tried it and it's fascinating that it really does. All of a sudden, whatever is about to bother you just disappears. Because you've recognized that God is behind everything and that really is God revealing himself in that way. And if you recognize that, then that thing which you think has independent force disappears or ceases to exist, ceases to be able to bother you. It's interesting segula. It was used many times uh, by many gedoyim, and it works. Anyway, uh, so that's Yichud Shlitasai. There is another Yichud, the third one, which I'm going to mention, which is very important, and that is that we think we have free will. And the answer is we do have free will. Of course we do. It says in the Torah, B'chat B'chaim, and you will choose life. But the interesting thing is that we think because we have free will, we can do whatever we want. In other words, we can frustrate the will of God in terms of bringing this creation to its intended state. But the answer is we can't. Yichot han hogosoi, that means that the world must reach its destination, even with the fact that we have free will. You see? How God pulls that off is one of the great mysteries of creation. But you cannot, it is impossible, it is inconceivable, that you can actually bring this world to a destination other than what God wants. Period. And with that, you can begin to understand a very interesting medrash. Because when Yaakov Avinu went to Egypt, finally, right? And he met Yosef, which was one of the most dramatic moments in the entire Chomash. I mean, he hasn't seen this, the, kid, the, the son that he loves for 22 years. And he thought he was dead. And all of a sudden, he realized he's alive. <coughs> he walks into the palace, and there's Yosef. And what do they do? Of course, they embrace. And Yosef, and the, and the Torah says, Yosef is crying. And, but it doesn't say Yaakov is crying. So the Chazal say, well, what was he doing? You know? So it says he was reading Kriyashma. It's incredible. He's meeting Yosef after 22 years and he's saying, Kriyashma? So how do we understand that? So the Bali Musa, 
want to say because what he did, he took the emotional high of meeting Yosef, but he didn't want to use it for himself. So what he did is in that emotional state, he said Kriyashma. He wanted to use it for God. You see, that's what he did. I mean, it's an incredible concept, you know. That's what a tzaddik is. But I never want to use it for myself. Now that I'm, I'm, I have this incredible emotional state, I will use it for God, right? That's, that's what the Bali Musa say. But really, you can say something different. Well, Yaakov realized that instant was an incredible insight. What was the insight? Here it was that what? Yosef is dead, as far as he was concerned. This is what he thought. Yosef is dead. That's number one. Number two, Yehuda, with the whole story of Tamar, he's finished, right? And then Shimon, the, you know, the, they, they got kidnapped. It's like everything fell apart. Everything fell apart, right? And all of a sudden, in one instant, everything not only didn't fall apart, but he realized that all of this was nothing more than to solve different problems, you see. Yaakov Avinu had to solve the problem that he did not honor his father and mother for 22 years. And that's why Yosef had to be taken away from him for 22 years. And therefore he was able to have a kapora because of that. He realized that, you see. Then he realized the concept that this is the prophecy of the uh, Jews being in a nation that they, they don't know and they will be there for hundreds of years. And of course he understood the whole concept of why. In other words, all of a sudden he realized that, hey, I thought everything fell apart. Meanwhile, not only did nothing fall apart, but everything was actualized exactly what caused this situation. That's Yichud Hanagosoy, you see, that in the end, God wins. You can't deviate. You cannot bring this creation to any other point except what God wants. The only thing you could choose is will you get reward for it or not, you see. So if you're an evil person and you try to defy God's will, it'll happen anyway, you see. And, uh, and, and, but the question is, since you didn't want to do it for God, you don't get rewarded. But if you did it because what God wanted, then you get rewarded because that's the mitzvah. So your choice is, you got to do it. The question is, uh, do you want to do it as a mitzvah or you want to do it to fulfill evil and so on. But in the end, God wins. There's no way around that. So you have three yichuds. Yichud mitziusoy, yichud shlitosoy, and yichud hanhagosoy. Very important ideas to remember. <clears throat> now, what the Rosh therefore wants is this concept of yichud, you see. He's going to conceal it in different ways. He wants to hide his properties, that he's the only one, he's the only force and the world must go into the direction. He's going to conceal it. Why? Because that's the task of man. You need to discover the attributes of God. That's what it is. So what he does is he, he brings forth an operation which Kabbalistically is called Simpson. And Simpson simply means that he conceals by however he does it. He conceals these yichuds. He conceals who he really is. And he says to man in that sense, you need to find who I am. Why does he do that? <clears throat> and because what it is, is God in many ways is very simple. You know, the reward that you get is the exact belief in the yichud of God. No more and no less. You see, <clears throat> I give an example where somebody's walking in the street, he's walking past the bank, and he sees a Brinks truck. These guys take money from bank to bank or whatever, right? And one of the guys says, stops the guy, you know, and says, wait a minute, you want to do, a, do me a favor? You want to help us out? We have three guys, but we're short one guy because he called in sick. If you want to do us a favor? We will give you a, uh, a cart, and you need to bring in sacks of cash into the bank. And of course, so you ask, you know, what am I going to get for this, you know? So the guy says, don't worry, we'll pay you well, right? Gives you a cart. They start loading sacks of cash, you know, you know, and uh, you take it, you roll it into the bank, and they're, of course, rolling their own cards, and they put it in the vault, right, and after about an hour, and you're really sweating after the hour, you know, and all the sacks of 
dollars in cash, all of that is now in the bank vault, you know. You turn to the guy and say, uh, okay, you know, well, where's, the, where's the money you're going to give him, right? So the guy says, okay, no problem. Come with me back to the vault. Go back into the vault. And the guy asks you, where's the stuff that you piled on? Where's the cash, the sacks? Uh, where in the vault is it? So you say, it's in that corner. And you, of course, you piled in about $10 million in the hour or whatever, you know. So uh, you put into the corners, that's where it is. So the guy says, those sacks that you piled into that bank, they're yours. They're yours. Did you believe this? You know, what does that mean? That means the task and the reward are identical. They're not two different things. They are identical. You see, and then the guy's probably saying, boy, if I would have known that the cash that I put in the bank is my reward, I would have done it much more. I would have, I would have you know, doled up really to get the stuff in. Oh, that's what God wants. The cash, in other words, the reward and the task are identical. So therefore, what's the reward? The reward is to experience the existence of God. It's really what it is, you see. In other words, what's interesting is, <clears throat> Can anybody here feel their existence? No. You know you exist, but you don't feel it, you see? You are it, you see? But you cannot experience existence itself. It's there, you see? But in Ulam Habo, which is the end, you experience your existence. What does that mean? Because you experience God himself. And since God is your existence, Guess what? You experience God. Now we cannot comprehend what that means, you see. But the thing is that in the experiencing of existence, which is experiencing God himself, we have no idea what that means, is the greatest pleasure known to any created being. Think about that. When was the last time you, got, you were sleeping in bed, morning arrived, the alarm clock went off, and you jumped out of bed, and you screamed, wow, another day! When was the last time you did that? <laughs> Think about that, you know? Eons ago, right? Probably was, I, I, probably you screamed up and say, oi, vey, another day. Right? It's probably more accurate and so on, you know? <clears throat> what kind of feeling is that? It's a feeling of unbelievable well-being, mm -hmm. which is rare, unfortunately. Well, and it's funny the way the English word is well-being. You see? Real existence, you know? Because at that moment, you really feel it if you exist, you see? Now, take that experience and multiply it almost by infinity. And that's one second of Ilum Habo, you see? And it's incredible. We cannot imagine the pleasure of a feeling of well-being that you have in Ilum Habo. So what God said is, listen, let's keep it simple. If in Ilum Habo you experience me, guess what? then the amount that you find me, that's your experience. It's up to you. It's like the amount of cash you put into the bank, that's the amount of cash you go on with. You see? So therefore, the task of man fundamentally becomes the search for the divine. It's really what it is. That's ultimately what the bottom line is. God wants you to search for the divine, for himself. You find it, you get it. You find it, uh, you find a lot of it, you get a lot of it. That's called Mida Kinegan Mida. That is called Din or Justice. And that's the way the world works. So, in many ways, that is the bottom line. Sounds great. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's not. Because this, what happens is that it becomes an enormous complication. And we have to be aware of that complication. You see. So, so far, this basically is what we have, okay. And we understand the logic of it. It is a search for a divine being, and like I said, that's what you will get in Ulam Habo. The actual feeling of existence itself, which means you will actually experience God, in whatever that means. Like, and the experience in Ulam Habo is not like any Malach understands. Don't think that there are angels, you know, that are already in that country called Vekas or Oilem Habo doesn't exist yet because we need to make Oilem Habo. This is the problem. No Malach 
has an inkling, any inkling of what the experience is in Ibn Habbo at all. And believe me, right now they are experiencing incredible things because they're spiritual, they're not even physical. But nobody really knows what the experience is. But we know it's the greatest thing that God can do for us, that type of an experience. Now, if that's the case, so what does the Bersham do? <clears throat> then what he's going to do is he needs to give us an instrument, a wherewithal, how do we get to that experience, you see? How do we get to the experience in what? Of beginning to understand this, these Yehudim, these onenesses of God. Because that's ultimately what God wants. So what does he do? So he gives us an instrument called a mitzvah. What is a mitzvah really? It's interesting to think about that, you see. What a mitzvah is, is in many ways, God creates an enormous amount of situations that have concepts. He creates the concept of, you know, of uh, country, of physical body, of wealth, poverty. These are all situations that he creates that a person can find himself in. And then what he does is he takes you and puts you into a unique predicament. You know, the totality of all the situations that you could be found. Why? Well, you could be sick, you could be healthy, you could be wealthy, poor, right? You could be strong or weak, you know? There's so many different types of situations that a person can exist in. You see, and he creates, let's assume there are a hundred trillion different types of possibilities. And he takes you and he decides, I'm gonna put you in this predicament. You're gonna be poor, but you can be very strong, you see, and I will make you happy. Now, within that situation, those combinations, you need to do what's called a mitzvah. What's the mitzvah? Because if you think about it, a mitzvah is now in some way going to interfere with your life. What does that mean? When you do a mitzvah, for instance, let's assume somebody wants to go uh, and, and uh, he wants to, he's walking, uh, let's say, in uh, Manhattan, let's say, and he hasn't eaten lunch, and he smells an incredible steak, you know, uh, wafting over, and he smells it, right? And he's like uh, West 86th Street or whatever, and the guy's starving, right? And all of a sudden, he's confronted. What's the confrontation? There's a mitzvah. Don't go and eat in that restaurant because it's faith, you see? So there's a battle going on. What's the battle? The battle is a battle of act. Should I go into that restaurant and eat, and eat, you know? Or I can't go in, I cannot do that act, and go into that restaurant, right? Because that's a mitzvah. So what the mitzvah is, it's a battle of act. Should I or should I not do the mitzvah? But what really is, on a deeper level, it's not a battle of act, it's a battle of will. Should I go into the restaurant and eat from that, whatever, steak and so on, right? Because, I want to do what I want to do, right? I got to, I'm entitled to a will, right? Or should I not go in because God's will is dominant? It's a battle of will. Whose will dominates? But the real concept is even deeper. Should I go in and eat in that restaurant? Because I want to eat in that restaurant. Why? Because I have a right to have an independent will of God because I exist independent of God, which is called Besides God, I also exist. Or I do not, I should not go into the restaurant, right? Because only God's will exists. You see, why? Because He's the only thing that exists. Comes out that every mitzvah ultimately is a test. Besides God, there's something else. Or there is nobody but God. It's interesting. A mitzvah forces you to choose. That's what it does, you see. And therefore, since you have to choose, what are you really choosing? You're really choosing what you think about yourself vis-a-vis -vis God. That's what the mitzvah does. So if you do the mitzvah, and ultimately you feel God is the only thing that exists, then you will experience that in the future world. That's the logic of the mitzvah. Why else would God subject you to interfere with this world? Because you've got to make a choice. What do you believe? Depending on your belief, that's what you're going to get. Are you going to or not? 
That's the logic of the mitzvah. You see. Now, but then there, there's somebody that what? That will go into the restaurant. So then what God demands of him is what? Well, what do you express? By doing the Avera, which means Yeshu Mavadra, besides God there's me, right? You need to change your mind. And that's called Tshuva. What Tshuva is, repentance, right, is to retract the original statement. What you're really saying is, I'm sorry God, before that I said that I'm, I exist, besides you I also exist. But now I'm saying, right, that I retract that testimony, right, and I now change my mind and I say that you're the only one that exists. So tshuva really is a retraction of a statement of belief that you said before. You see? So that again involves you believing that God is the only one. But what happens if a person doesn't do tshuva, right? So then what happens? So God created a third device. It's called the soon of suffering. And the question is, what's the logic of suffering? You see, one of the logic is, is that you did the sin and you enjoyed the sin, so therefore you have to undo the pleasure that you got from the sin. And suffering, believe me, obviously, is a very highly unpleasant experience. So it's a meter connect meter because you are now undoing the pleasure that you received from doing the sin. But it's much deeper than that. Because what the suffering does, you see, it forces you to acknowledge, you see, that you are not what you think you are. Because if you really thought of yourself as being somebody, then remove the suffering. But you can't. So you come to terms with a very important idea that really I'm limited, extremely limited. And I'm not who I think I am. So therefore, what that leaves you is a strong possibility that once you've denied your own importance, you can now maybe begin to think maybe there's another being that is the main being, you see. So suffering is a wake-up call in a certain sense where it allows you to see who you are and how limited you really are and so on. In any case, so therefore what God did is he allowed these three types of experiences, either mitzvah, or tshuva, or yisurim. And those are the things that we must always involve ourselves with in the Torah. That's why the Torah is basically a mitzvah book. Think about that. You know, the Torah, when you look at Torah, what is the Torah, what's the main theme of the Torah? Yeah, it's got stories that illustrates, you know, how to act and how to behave and all that. But in the end, what's the Torah? It's a Tariyad book. It's really a book of 613 commandments. So the question you have to ask yourself, why is God so obsessed with giving us mitzvahs? Why? Why is the mitzvah so dominant in Judaism? You see? Why? It's a mystery to many people. You see? Why does God look like he wants total control over my life? Right? Because everywhere I face, there's another mitzvah staring at me. And a mitzvah means either do this, so it's controlling my actions, or don't do that. You know, it's like an incredible, uh, 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 it's almost, it looks almost like a, um, where I'm completely limited in my activities. And now we understand, because what God did, he created a host of concepts, situations. He puts you into a type of situation, and he says, okay, in that situation, you need to see who I am. You need to declare, besides God, there's nothing else. You see, that's what he did. So he picked out a predicament that you have, right, within the billions of possibilities, you see, and you need to come out with that concept. And that concept is everything he wants. There is nothing else he wants. Because that concept of Eino Yimavada, when you do the mitzvah, is Oilam Habo. Is what Oilam Habo is all about. There is nothing else, you see. There's Oilam Habo or there's annihilation. If you don't get Oilam Habo, what do you get? You are annihilated. You don't, it's not Gehenim. Gehenim is a place of atonement. People don't understand. There's only one place in the future, and it's called Oilam Habo. 
If you're in it, it's phenomenal. And if you're not in it, there is no other place. You've disappeared from existence. That's the deal, you see? Uh, so therefore, <coughs> God is completely uh, 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 consumed with your getting into Yom Habo. That's why the Torah is really a mitzvah book. Because that's what it's all about. It's all about Yom Habo. And what Yom Habo basically is, is infinite bliss eternally. That's what it is, you see? And, and therefore, that's why mitzvahs so dominate the, uh, the Torah itself. Because in the end, the game, the end game is what? Is Olam Habo, where you experience the Rebbe Shalom's Because that's really what you experience. I realize I'm very highly philosophical, but you have to hear it once, you see. Because really, this is really what it's all about. <clears throat> In any case, where do we see this, by the way? Well, we say it twice a day. Shema Yisrael Hashem Nukein Hashem Echot. Here is your God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? And we know that the ayin of Shema and the dollar of Echot is large, right? And if you put ayin and dollar together, it spells eight, witness. God wants you to witness, say testimony. You need to be a witness testimony that He is one. And what happens if you do that? Then do the same ayin dalit, but reverse it. Dalit ayin is da. You will know that. You will know the actual enyod mavada that you testify to. You will know it because you will experience it in Ulam Habo. Those ayin dalit is really the entire game plan of God. Testify to the echad, and you will know the echad. Experience it in the future world. It's that simple, really, you know. In any case, <clears throat> now we come to the real life. This is the whole theoretical, what's called the theoretical formulation of what has to be. <clears throat> now God has to put it into practice. And then now we begin to understand what's called the condition of a human. Once, once we have the theoretical understanding, uh, now let's get into what God did. So what does Hashem do? Um, he takes the divine presence. Okay? What is the divine presence? It's called the Shekhinah. What is the Shekhinah? Okay. The Shekhinah is the expression or the manifestation of God as He can be known to us. Because we remember, in the end, the Barsham cannot be known by us because we cannot penetrate who he is in absolute sense. So what he does is he creates, and the Shrina is a Nivra, by the way, he creates an entity that represents God. You see, that's called the Shrina. And we're not getting into the, the nature of it and so on, but we know it as a divine presence. Is the divine presence God? The answer is no. <coughs> We can, never, we can never know God without getting into the whole thing. But we can experience what He revealed and allows to exist as a representation of Himself. And that is the Divine Presence. Okay? So, the Divine Presence is what? It's whatever it is. But the Divine Presence is very interesting, you see. Because on one side, it's like a coin. Heads and tail. On one side of the coin is what? Is the Shekhinah. On the flip side of the coin is the Neshama. The soul is part of the Shekhinah. The Neshama is part of the Shekhinah. It's called the insight and so on. That's the way it is. It's like a coin. Heads and tails. Right? And it's really one coin, but it's two different, it's two different expressions. One side of this coin is the the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence. And the other side of the coin is the Neshama. That's it. It's the soul, you see. So what the Barsham now does is he splits the Neshama from the Shekhinah, you see. It's how, how he does it, but he allows the Neshama to, in many ways, to individuate into a separate entity. That Neshama is basically called Knesset Israel. okay? The Congregation of Israel. That 
neshama, which is huge, is the totality of all the neshamas of Klai Yisrael. Everybody, you see. That's the first grand split. He splits the neshama from the shechina. Then he does another split. He takes the individual neshama itself and he fragments that into thousands and thousands of individual neshamas. And in each one he gives consciousness. He allows each neshama to have its own consciousness. That's the second great split. The third great split is he takes an individual neshama, which is a fragment, and he splits that into what? Into a zoha and an akeva, into a male and a female. Because the concept of masculinity and femininity are really different roles that the neshama has. So one part of the neshama assumes a masculine identity, okay, and the other part of the neshama, of those fragments, assumes a feminine identity, without getting into Zohar and Akeva, what the identities are. So it comes out that the Barsham splits it three ways. Neshama from Shrina, each Neshama is split into thousands and thousands of individual Neshamas, right? And each one has a consciousness. And the third split is the, the one, one fragment of Neshama itself is now split from a Zohar into a Zohar and the Akeva. This is what happens. Now, after that, something very bizarre happens. I'll tell you something, and it's a very fascinating concept. <clears throat> what is the most basic human need of all? I'm going to a little psychology here. What's the bedrock? What is the bottom psychological need of every human that exists? There are basically two of them. One makes sense, and the other makes absolutely no sense. And you'll understand why. What makes sense? The most basic human emotion, or rather the most basic human need and therefore drive, is called self-preservation. Nobody wants to die. Nobody. You see. If somebody commits suicide, it's only because the pain of living has become much worse than the death of the individual, you see. But basically, self-preservation is what everybody walks around with. That's the first thing we're always thinking about. How do I maintain my life? How do I continue going? Right? How do I preserve my existence? There's nothing that's below that. So that makes sense, right? And, but, but, and, and because we want to live, what do we do, right? We look to get jobs, we want to eat, right? And so on. We want to make sure that we're secure. That means that we're not afraid of threats or threats to our uh, ability to live and survive. It, it, it's responsible for an enormous amount of behaviors that we do. That's why we have bank accounts, you see? Because we need to make sure that we will be able to pay for our rent and our food, you see? I don't want to go into the whole thing, but it's a fascinating the amount of human behavior that is an expression of what's called security needs or self-preservation is enormous. So that makes sense. But there's something else that doesn't make sense. It's called the, 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 the desire or the need for self-worth. Am I somebody or not? What is self-worth? Self-worth is when a person says to himself, I'm somebody. I'm worth something, right? You can use other expressions of self-worth. It's called self-esteem, self-respect, <clears throat> you see? They're all similar ideas, but in the end it means one thing. I'm somebody. I'm not a nobody. Now, <clears throat> believe it or not, everybody is driven to be somebody. It's the, the next is self-preservation, it is the most fundamental need of a human. If you understood the amount of activities that you do in a given day to prove or to assert you're somebody, you'd be stunned. You don't even realize how unconsciously that dominates your behavior. You know, I'm bringing it to your attention for the first time probably, but you cannot believe the amount of human activity that's involved 
and feeling like a somebody. You see? Your relationship with your spouse. Power struggle. What is a power struggle? Right? Who's somebody? Hey, don't tell me what to do. Right? What does that really mean? I'm somebody. You can't tell me what to do. You, you see? You know? Or, um, or um, you know, um, I, I need to get a job. If I don't get a job, I'm nobody. Because society doesn't value people, right, that don't have jobs. They think you're a schnorrer or whatever you are, or a welfare recipient. Yeah, but a guy feels like he's a nobody if he doesn't have a job. You see, so you gotta look for a job, right? Then there's a guy who's got like, uh, you know, a hundred million dollars. He also feels like a nobody. So how does he get to feel like a somebody? Because every once in a while, or I should say on a daily basis, right, he looks on the internet for his bank account, sees how much money it got, right? Why? Because, huh, I feel great just looking at it, right? and so on. Or uh, he donates, you know, a million dollars toward the construction of, a, let's say, a shul. Why? Because he's got to have his name on a plaque. So people will look at the plaque and say, wow, who is this guy, right? Yeah, but why, did he, why the other guy? Why did he, the, 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 the wealthy guy do it? Because now he feels like a somebody. You see, if you ever sat down and thought about how many things you do on a daily basis, you can't believe that almost all of it is directed to feeling like it's somebody, you see? And not like a nobody, okay? It's incredibly dominant, you know, uh, uh, in human behavior. Now, the question you have to ask is, why? This is crazy. You think an animal goes around saying, do I feel like a somebody or not? <laughs> Animals don't have a, a need for being a somebody. You see, there's only one thing an animal needs to do. And that dominates its behavior. And the answer is survival. That's why they're called territorial, you know? Animals will guard their territory because their territory is basically their food supply, you see? But an animal doesn't gotta guard its territory because you're into it. Animals don't have inferiority complexes. Only humans have. But what's an inferiority complex? An inferiority complex is what? When you feel like a nobody. That's what it is. You see? An inferiority complex is when you have a constant state of feeling like a nobody. So, I mean, I can go on and on about this, but the question is, why do people need to feel like somebody? That's absurd. You are somebody. Why? I mean, because you exist. That's why you're somebody. Why do you have to keep proving this? That's the question. <clears throat> Humans always have to feel like somebody. They are constantly reasserting the fact that they have self-worth, you see. And what will destroy a person, what the underlying uh, def the defect uh, in all mental illness is the person feels like a nobody, you see. That's the greatest uh, underlying idea of psychological health, you see. Every single uh, facet of mental health is where somehow the person feels like a nobody. Either I was neglected, I was rejected, you see, uh, or people don't value me in any way. Once feelings of nobodyness comes in, bad news. Then the person has to build a whole defensive psychological defensive structure where he can feel like somebody and if it gets worse and worse, where even that won't help, then he has to do what's called a psychological break and he becomes psychotic. A psychotic person is an individual that has such a great need to be somebody that he had to break with reality because reality was just too harsh. So he just broke with it and he assumes another reality and in that reality that he assumes, he feels like a somebody. Anyway, that's the question. And the answer is very interesting. There are two origins for inferiority. One is the one that we're, we're familiar with. It's called the psychological inferiority. If a person grew up in a family, and let's say the father rejected the child, or abused the child, always put the kid down, or whatever, real negative behavior, that kid, generally speaking, will grow up with real problems about his self-worth. That's psychological inferiority. But here's another interesting concept. 
And now we begin to understand why we need to be somebody. Because it's not always psychological. It's called existential inferiority. When the Rabbi Hashem disconnected the Neshama from him, what happened to the Neshama? Hey, wait a minute. God is everything. You're disconnecting me. What happens? I'm nobody. Because inherently we are nobody unless we are connected to God in a way that we are cognizant of the connection. But what happens if you're not cognizant? Because the revolution instituted a barrier. Now what? So the neshama develops, okay, an existential inferiority because it's now no longer connected to the revolution. And not only that, what's even worse is when the revolution takes the neshama and inserts it into a goof, into a human, then the neshama really feels like a nobody, you see. All of a sudden, a person has this incredible drive, you see, to reassert its being because it has been removed. Of course, the God has never really removed himself, but he does not allow the neshama to experience that. So therefore, the neshama now experiences what's called an existential inferiority. Interesting, isn't it? That's why this irrational concept of self-worth exists. That's why. It's not a physical thing that's psychological. It could be. Don't get me wrong. You know, there, are, there could be situations that a person psychologically feels like a nobody. Insecure, or actually inferior. Okay? But what happens to people who have a great upbringing? You know, they had great parental attention. They got what they wanted. They were always praised. They were made to feel confident about themselves. Why are they always running after feeling like it's somebody? What's their problem? Religion. And it's existential. That's their problem. This is the inherent flaw in man. Very interesting. And it explains why humans are always trying to be like somebody. And all their behavior is in that direction or it's always piggyback on something else. Even when a guy collects money because he's insecure and he wants to make sure he has a lot of money in the bank so he will always have his needs met, right? But that money also serves to make him feel like somebody. It's always there, you see? And I'll tell you something, I'll show you something even more which most people don't realize. When you sit down to have a great meal and you're enjoying it, you are feeding your self-worth. Because the mere act of existing makes you feel like somebody. It's very, it's very subtle, but it's there. People don't realize that. It's not like you know you have to do something that obviously you know indicates to somebody you know where you're having an argument with with a guy, and all of a sudden you win the argument, and you walk away saying, "Oh, wow, who I am, right?" Just to sit down at a meal and exercise your existence automatically makes you feel like somebody, but you never feel it. That's how subtle it is. Anyway, but we now come to a whole different understanding. This is an existential inferiority. The mere fact that you're separate from the Rabbana Shalom, right? And you've, you've been inserted into a physical body, so you don't even see God anymore. And you're not even allowed to experience Him, you see? Because that's how we're born. You will feel like a nobody. And that's why you're going to spend your whole life trying to get back the feeling of somebody. But the paradox is, is that nobody. you never can feel like a somebody. There's only one way to do it. And that's to feel like a nobody connected to God. That's humility. <laughs> what a paradox. The only way to feel like a somebody, right, is if you deny that you're anybody. That's called anivus, right? And then you reattach to God. Oh, that's why tzaddikim are the most sane people in the world. <coughs> because they connected to the Rebbeinah It's a paradox, which is interesting, you see. So therefore, this is now the human condition. Very important to understand how we, what's our origin. So we begin to understand the fundamental psychological drives of a human, and that a lot of it, or the whole concept of a drive that appears to be irrational, is really spiritual. That's its origin. You see, anyway, now we go begin to understand 
the problem here. You see? Now, why did the Bajam do that? Why does he want it to feel like a nobody? You see? And this is the human condition that he now creates. And now it becomes really fascinating how it all manifests. You know what's interesting? <clears throat> All humans are preoccupied with one of three things. One, there are people, right? There are people who want to become God. They're trying to become God. Not literally, but figuratively, you know? They want to be remembered. They want to be great. They want to be in control. They want possessions because then they feel like somebody, you know? But really, in the heart of everybody is, I would love to become God. Wow, what an incredible privilege, right? But if they can't become God, there are many people that want to overthrow God, right? And then for those people who are not into overthrowing God, right, there are people walking around who think they are God. You see, it's always all about God. And you see this in the Chumash, okay? Who's the guy who wants to become God? Oh, the Mauritian. He wants to become God. Now we begin to understand the condition of man and how it perfectly allows us to get rid of Abba. You see, <clears throat> what happened with other Mauritian, right? Chava. God says, don't eat from this tree. Okay? Stay away from that tree. It's a das, uh, uh, it's a chaim and so on, right? Uh, it's a das, you cannot eat from the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, and so on, right? And then all of a sudden, Chava is walking, right? And also she encounters a snake. Now that snake, obviously, is the mouthpiece of the sultan. And what does the sultan do? He knows exactly the condition of man because he's the one who's commanded to tempt him. So he says to Chava certain interesting things. But one of the things he says to her is, Visim Kim, you could be like God. Now why would he say that? If Chava didn't feel a need to be God, then why would that tempt her? You see? I can't tempt you to eat stones. You're not interested in stones. So why would that be a temptation? You see? But clearly Chava wants to be God. And so does Adam. You see? Of course what these Nochash said was false. Of course. But the Nochash knew that man wants to be God. Why? Because man needs to feel like somebody. Because in being God is the ultimate, ultimate remedy, right, of inferiority. You know, God does not have an inferiority complex, you see, because he is, and so on, you know. <clears throat> but why would Chava have this feeling and therefore be tempted and, of course, fall because that she fell, <coughs> right? And the answer is because that's the existential inferiority. Now, what was his, what was his message to Chava? It's very important. What he said to Chava is this. You see that tree that God doesn't want you to eat, you see? That is the power source of God. Rashi says that. In other words, God ate from that tree, and that's why he became God. He can create worlds. You see, if you eat from that tree, you will be as God. This is what he tells Chava. What was he really saying? You see, now, Chava knew that God was incredible. You see, she came in on the sixth day, and all of a sudden she comes into a world, Gan Eden, right? That was fabulous. You see, and she knew that she didn't make it. She knew that God made Gan Eden, and it was absolutely fabulous. Like we say, boy, what a Gan Eden, right? You see, so she couldn't fool herself. So she knew that God was Yichud Mitzvah uh, She knew that God was an incredible force, unbelievable creative abilities, you see? But she did not know Yichud Mitzvah because God concealed that aspect of Yichud from her. Uh, you see. And the Nochash, of course, knew that. She didn't know. So that's what the Nochash said. By the way, if you eat from this tree, there's something else besides God. You think God is the only real uh, power? Uh, no. Because besides God, there's another power source. So she didn't know that God is the only thing that exists. She thought that maybe there's something else. And not only that, but that thing else could be superior to God, which is the tree. 
Because God ate from it, and that's how it became. So it comes out that the tree is more powerful than God. So she fell for that line, you see. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> the Yichud Mitzi'uso, the fact that God is the only being, she did not know. And that was the temptation that the Nochash, which is a Sutton, gave her. <clears throat> and she wanted to be somebody, and that's the existential inferiority. She fell. She goes back to Adam and gives him the same, she already knew it was false, because she ate from the tree, and lo and behold, she wasn't God. So she knew the whole thing was a sham. But in any case, she went back to Adam and offered him the same lie, unfortunately. And he, of course, fell for it, and he ate from the tree, and of course they were both punished. What was the test here? Remember, every test is a test of Enoi Bavadoi, because that's what Oilam Abba is. You, every test that you do will always reflect what do you think about God. You see? So what was the test? The test was this. What do they think about who's the boss? You see? So the test of Adam and Chava was, is the tree the real boss? And God just took advantage and ate from that tree? Or they saw right through the argument of the Nochash, and they said, what is this? This is ridiculous. There is no tree, the whole thing is an illusion, and this Satan or the Nachash is trying to trap us. You see, so remember one thing. When you have a test of Enid Mavadoi, you must have an alternative option, or you have no test. What was the option? The option is either God is the boss, or the tree is the boss. That's the power source. You see, and that's what makes the test so difficult. You can't just say, well, will I believe that God is Enoi Mavadoi? No. There's got to be an alternative. Is God the Enoi Mavadoi? Or is the tree the Enoi Mavadoi? You see? That was Adam Horishan and Chava's test before the Chet. There has to be these two things. Because a human being must be tested on what does he believe about God? Because that's the reward in Oinam Habo. Their test, who is the real McCoy? Is it God or is it the tree? And they fail, you see. So that was before the Chet. That was their test. But again, it must involve a situation where they have to choose who is God. That Every test must involve that. Uh, in any case, they fail. <clears throat> After the Chet, everything changed. But there still has to be a test. There still has to be a conflict. There's got to be an option. Is it God or is it something else? What replaced the tree? Remember, before the Chet of Adam, what was there? Well, it's either God or it's a tree. Because that's what it means. Adam ate from the tree, right? And that's what he ate for, the, the Nochot said, eat from the tree, and you will be God. Well, obviously, if that's the case, because God ate from the tree, then obviously the tree is a greater power source, ex ex entity that exists, than God. That's what makes it complicated, you see? There's got to be an option for, to fool you. So the question is, after the Chet, what was the option? No. You know what the option was? It's either God or you, yes, sir. you yes, sir. man. You go. Correct. That's the option now. So you see? Man is the tree of the field? Man is the option. I am God. You see? I am. You see? That, so what happens now is that every situation now begs, begs you to choose. Do you think God is the boss? Or do you think that you are the boss? That's, and since man is driven existentially to be somebody, he falls easily. That's what happens, you see? Uh, so what happens now, there's an option here. Every person has to decide who is the boss. Is it God or is it me? Therefore, should I do the mitzvah or not? Because if he's the boss, then his will is the only thing that exists if I have to do the mitzvah. But if I'm the boss, Hey, I'm going right into that restaurant, eat that steak. You see? <clears throat> Why? Because I also exist. Now, it may seem strange to you. I mean, what kind of contest is there? 
You really think you're God? Yes. You ever hear there many people walking around think either they are God or they want to become God or they think they're God's gift to the world? Uh, you know, okay, so I'm not God. Uh, but don't fool yourself. I'm his gift, right? <laughs> you know how many guys walk around think that way? It's hilarious, right? Uh, people act as if they are God or God's appointee or his surrogate, right? Or his secretary, or whatever you want to say, right? <clears throat> That's what people think. I mean, go out into the world. There's so many arrogant people out there. So of course, what do they think they are anyway? And the answer is, it's either God, or God's gift, or God's secretary, or God's vice president. It's one of those things. Uh, that's the option that a person has to choose, you see? And with that kind of a context, right, then the question is, am I going to do a mitzvah or not? Because the mitzvah is a direct result of your belief. If you believe that God is the real thing, you'll do his mitzvahs. If you believe you are, have some kind of say-so, of course you're not going to do the mitzvah. Or you're going to do it half-heartedly. You see, <clears throat> this is what happened after the Chet of Odom. Is that the option was replaced. It's no longer the tree. It's you that replaced them. It's a very important concept. You see, and that is the illusion of man. The whole concept of who do you think you really are. Now, to fool you, you see, or to make it more difficult, you see, what God did is certain things, phenomenon or phenomena, that fool you. One, really it's Enoi Mavadoi. Only God exists. But now you think that there are other beings besides God. First of all, because we live in a physical world. And the mere fact that we're physical automatically means we don't feel God. We don't feel spiritual. So we are fooled in thinking, right, that there's another world called the physical universe. That's separate from God. Once you've achieved separateness, what's the problem? That I can also be somebody, a God, or a God-like person. See? The second thing that fools you is that there are many other forces. Every person looks like he's his own force. You see? Therefore, God is not the only force. Not, so not only is Yichud Metziusso concealed, but even Yichud Shlitosoi, even the fact that God is the only force or the only cause, that is also an illusion. Because, hey, you seem to make money because you know what you're doing. You're obviously independent of God. You know, we don't see that God gives you everything. I see. We see everybody going out and doing and causing things to happen. That means that there are real causes, you see? So that fools us. So the fact that we're physical fools us. The fact that we are, we, we see that causal ability, that's what fools us. And not only that, you know, in a quiet moment, each one of us has a sense of self. We don't feel God, we feel ourselves. And we have a sense of self. Once you have a sense of self, then if you feel like you exist independent of God. In fact, it's even hard to understand, how can we be part of him? Because I really feel like I'm separate, don't we? We feel like we're separate. We don't feel like we're part of God, you see? So that heightens the illusion we have of an option that we are somebody, you know, and we are a demigod or something like that, uh, you see? And um, besides that, I have consciousness, right? I don't, I don't, I don't see God. I don't think about him in that sense, you know. I, I have obviously what's called a consciousness, which is a part of God. So therefore I believe that I am a part of God. Uh, everything about us is that we are separate from God, you see. So when, why can't I have the illusion that I'm somebody, you see. We're fooled by what's called the human condition, you see. And it is within that condition that you need to figure out you're zero and it's all God. In fact, we now understand something very important. When Adam sinned, God came over to him and ordered the famous, what seems to be a curse, In the sweat of your brow you will eat bread. You know, so we look at that as a curse, correct? In other words, until now you had a freebie, right? You could walk through the garden, pick out the fruit, do whatever you want. It was great. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> you know? So now God said, well, 
Now you gotta sweat to pull off the fruit, right? So to us, it's a curse, which means that God is saying, you know, you gotta work for a living, too bad. Vacation's over. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You're not gotta go out and work. That's what we think it is. But that's not what it is, at all. You know what the real shot in the sweat of your brow you need to eat? You will eat. You will eat bread. Here's what God said. Ah, you ate from that tree. He's looking at Adam. And God says to Adam, You ate from that tree, right? Because you actually think that there could be another power source other than God. Or else why would you have eaten from it? So therefore, you are now under the illusion that there could be something else of God. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to increase the intensity of the illusion measure for measure. Because until now, you used to walk around and just pick the tree, you know, the apples and whatever, right? And so on, right? But you knew it was for me, because I created the garden. But now, right, the only way you're going to have food is if you work. So you think you've caused your panasa. Because it's no longer obvious that that's me giving you panasa, right? It's now going to be only, it will only respond to your acts, your cause. Yeah, but wait a minute. Even then it's really from God, except we now have a greater illusion. Because it looks like I'm a real cause, right? I go out, right? I work, and I get a check. Well, who gave me the check, right? It's the work, it's the boss, right? It's... It, you know, it's, it was my effort that got me the check, not God. But we know the real truth is, of course, the check is all from God. Except God is masquerading himself behind what's called the work situation. <clears throat> but it's much harder to figure out because the illusion is worse. Because now, because the only way I got the check is when I what? Is when I went to work. So I think, I did it. It's my work. I am the boss. I'm God. You see, <clears throat> so it's not that God cursed Adam. What he did is he made the situation much worse for Adam to figure out that even though it looks like you're a cause, you're not. I'm the cause. That's bad news for Adam. So that's what Bezeh Sapecha really is. It's where God changed the human condition. Where now the only way you can get something, money or whatever it is, right, or food and so on, is if you actually act like a cause. But don't think you're a cause, you see? So we now have to break through the illusion that even though it's only going to come, if we act like a cause, do not think you are the cause. You go figure that out, right? Go break through that illusion. It's terrible, you know? I mean, people are walking around as they think, it's me. Also, there's a chil as a, right? A guy, all of a sudden, he's in the stock market, right? And all of a sudden, he has this brilliant idea. But wait a minute. I see now, this stock is going to go up, you know, because whatever the circumstances, you know, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy into it when it's low, and it's going to go up, right? And let's assume he buys into it low, right? <coughs> and it goes up. And the guy made a million dollars in one day, right? What do you think that guy's going to say? I'm incredible. I'm just absolutely incredible. You know, it was me. It was my brilliance. The ability to analyze. You see? That's what he's going to say. That was the illusion of causality. Because it's true that the only way he made that money is because he did have the idea, and he invested, and it went up. It looks like he was the cause. But did he ever ask himself the question, who put that idea in my mind? Who did that? I had an idea. Wait, it just popped into my mind. Was it really because I'm brilliant? Of course not. Because uh, the Bosham said, okay, guys, let's feed them exactly how to make the million bucks that day. You know? And all of a sudden, he's having incredible ideas. But he thinks it's because he's brilliant. It has nothing to do with him. It's the Bosham wanted him to make the million dollars. So, how's he going to break through this? Very hard. Imagine the guy's got to say, you know, Bosham, thank you so much for putting the idea in my mind. You know? How many guys say that? I mean, Wall Street is walking around with unbelievably arrogant people. You know, I hate to say it, but these guys think they're God. The only time they wake up, maybe, is when the stock goes down. <laughs> they say, wait a minute, I thought I was God. I made a mistake. Tomorrow, I'll be God again. You see, today it didn't work. You see, <clears throat> this is the problem. 
All these people that have billions of dollars and millions of dollars, or they're at the height of their game in their fields, it's all the Rebbe them. You see? Because here's the obvious concept. How in the world can you have any ideas if you cannot even exist into the next nanosecond by yourself? Can you tell me how that works? Uh, you cannot, you don't even have the will to exist in the next nanosecond unless the person wills you to exist. So then how in the world can you have a great idea to make money in the market? You can't even exist into the next second, let alone have an idea of what to do. You see, but they don't think about that. And this is the illusion of man. What the Barsham did is he changed the test. It's no longer between me and the eights, the three, you know? It's now between me and you. Now you gotta break out of it. And because of the sin of autumn, he actually makes it more difficult by creating in man the illusion of causality. That's why the greatest thing that we have to worry about is, uh-oh, you know, what do we think about ourselves, about our contribution? Uh, <clears throat> that's why the greatest individual, and this is the guy at the top of the game, of, is when you're called an Ebed Hashem. When you realize that everything is the Marsha, <clears throat> that you're a servant, and that's why Anivas, humility, is the greatest of all midas, because that's the truth. We do nothing. In fact, Moshe Rabbeinu, who is obviously the greatest Jew, was incredible, even he said, V'nachnu mar. What are we? We're nothing. This is Moshe Rabbeinu, you know? He realized he's zero. And that's therefore, because he had such an incredible contact with the Baruch you know, he, he broke through the illusions. That's what he did. He realized that all of it is an illusion. It's all about God. It's nothing about us. And the reward we get is when we make it all about God. That is the paradox. Uh, that's when we make it, you see. So that's what Moshe Rabbeinu said. That's why the Torah gives him the greatest attribute of all. The Oish Moshe and the man Moses was the most humble man on earth. That was the greatest statement ever made, if you think about that. Because what does it mean humble? Because as far as Moshe Rabbeinu said, of course I'm a great man. But all the things that make me great is a gift of God. It has nothing to do with me. Because inherently and intrinsically, I'm nothing. It's like a blackboard. The Bosham took a blackboard and he wrote on it. These are the attributes I will give this blackboard. That blackboard is called Moshe Rabbeinu. And he gave me incredible attributes. But it's all because the Bosham wrote on the blackboard he gave Moshe. See? We don't realize how completely independent, uh, dependent we are on the Bosham. Maybe if we did realize that we were plots, we couldn't handle it. That, that's the, but, the, but the truth of the matter uh, is that, that's why the Russian calls Moshe Ever Hashem. He's a servant of the Lord. Whatever he does, he always has me in mind, you see. And that's why humility is the greatest of all meters, you see. Because what humility is, is what? It's nothing more than the correct perception of who you are. That's all humility is, you see. And in the end, we are really nothing. I shouldn't say nothing. We are exactly what God made us. Period. But it's all from Him. None from us. You see? <coughs> Which is remarkable. <clears throat> you know? And just to use an example, you all heard of the Vilna Goyen. Right? It's among the greatest Tamil Chacham where, you know, in the last thousand years. Uh, right? But was it all because of the Vilna Goyen? No. The Vilna Goyen is nobody. Zero. If Moshe Rabbeinu said he's zero, right? How much more so the Vilna Goyen? Yet to us, we cannot even believe the Vilna Goyen, how great he was. How, why was he so great? Because God said, I'm going to fill out the, the, uh, the blackboard of the Vilna Goyen, right? And I'm going to give him all these incredible attributes. But it's all God. The Russian gave it to him for whatever reason. And therefore, the credit of the Vilna Goyen is that he used it for God's sake. That's the credit. As that whatever gifts he got from the Bosham, this incredible memory, this incredible mind, and so on, you know, he used it to serve God. That's the credit he gets in the future world. But in the future world, there is no statement about, wow, who he is, because he isn't in the future world. It's purely what the Bosham gave him. 
The only credit we can say about ourselves is what? Is that we will use the gifts that God gave us to the full extent to serve God. And that brings me to this point. In the end, at the bottom line of the avoido is this. Now that you understand what the human condition is and why it is that way, the fight or the contest, God or is it me? Which is it? And so on, right? And then you begin to realize, what does God want? What God wants is called the SG ratio. What's the SG ratio? Uh, self versus God. Who wins? That's what it's about. In every activity that you do, there is always that ratio. <coughs> Am I doing this because I want to do it? Self? Or I'm doing it because I want God. I'm doing it because God wants me to do it. It's the ratio of self versus God. Uh, you see? Because that's really the contest. Is it me or God? You see? So therefore, in everything, the ultimate evade, the ultimate uh, 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 individual uh, that serves God is always thinking, when I do this, is it because I want to do it for myself? Because I want to get something out of it, right? Or is it the, the uh, I'm doing it for the Rosh uh, There are many stories, you know. It's like it's just one story, which is interesting. The Yoda, the Baba Sali. Baba Sali? Yeah, whatever. He's obviously a very great man, uh, but there was there's many stories about him. But there was one story about him which was very interesting. Uh, his I think his rabbits had made a dish, you know, and he was eating it, you know, and uh, it obviously must have been very good, you know. So he was eating it for about three minutes, then all of a sudden he pushed it away, and he said, "It's too good." What was he saying? Because he now began to eat it because he wanted to eat it. You see. She obviously made a great chant, whatever she made. I don't know if his father made chant. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but whatever it was, uh, but here's a man that always thought about, well, why am I doing this? Because I want to do it, I'm getting a lot of pleasure. But because it's for God. So all of a sudden, he was able to do it for two or three minutes, right? And, but even he realized, uh-oh, this is too good. And all of a sudden, what's called, in Yiddish, it's called the zikh. The self entered and said, come on, eat it, because I love to eat this stuff, you see? And he realized he was pushing God out. I wasn't doing it because God wants me to be healthy and enjoy whatever, right? His motive entered the picture, and he said, no good. And he pushed it away. I mean, how many, how many guys can do that, right? And push away a food, right? Uh, but that's a very interesting story that illustrates the power of you know, and what the ultimate objective, the ultimate, it's something that you can work, you should know, for years. It's not easy, very hard, very hard to push yourself out of the picture, get your motives out, and just do it for the motion. And believe me, it's, it's incredibly difficult, you know, it, take a, it could take a lifetime, easy. And most people never really do it in a total way, they do it partially, where some things they can do for God, some things they do for themselves, or in the very same activity, you know, 90% uh, is self, 10% is God, you know, however, you know, and so on, whatever the ratio is, right? But the avoid is always that concept. <coughs> Who is it for? Is it because you want to do it for yourself, or is it because you're doing it to bring what's called a nachas ruach, uh, a degree of incredible satisfaction to God himself? <coughs> you see? The SG ratio, that's what it's called. So when you're about to do something, you know, whatever you want to do, fine. Just ask yourself, is it S or is it G? Which is it, you know? And listen, you work toward it, you know, even if it's S, okay. But the fact that you acknowledge and you understand the essential of Vido is critical. That itself will elevate you in the Edom Habo. Because God knows, listen, it's not easy, you know. But God will say to you in the end of time when he's judging you, he say, you know, I know you had a hard time. And I know a lot of the stuff that you did was really because you wanted to do it for yourself. But I'll tell you something. I'm impressed that you had me in mind also. <laughs> I'm impressed. Uh, you know, and because you had me in mind, even though you did it for yourself, I'm going to give you an unbelievable item. Because the thought itself is incredible. 
God will respect and honor your thought. And you say to God, listen, I'm only human, you know, and I believe, you know, and I'm far from a tzaddik and all that. Uh, you know, but the value of just thinking, is it me or God? And that's the contest here, right? That itself will bring you to tremendous heights in Oilam Habor and even in Oilam Hazer. Because God realizes the difficulty. Now, how many people can be Moshe Rabbeinu? How many people can be Baba Sali or the Vilna Goyen or any of these people, really? Lifetime of work, you know? So I'm saying, if you think about it and you're aware of the activity before you do it and say, oh, look, I know I'm doing it because, you know, I want to enjoy this or I want to do it for my sake and so on and so forth. You're already way ahead. You're way ahead. So don't think it's impossible, it's too late. No such thing. Very important idea. What do we see from all this? Uh, we now understand <clears throat> a lot of information. I've gone through the yichuds of God, you see, and then he conceals the yichud, right? And that's the task for you to uncover those yichuds, you see? And I've gone through the whole concept of the makeup of man, right? The soul and so on, and the origins of inferiority, psychological inferiority and existential or spiritual inferiority. And that's what makes sense why we're all trying to feel like somebody. Because other than that, it makes absolutely no sense. It's absurd, actually. And so on, you know. <clears throat> and what the repercussions are. Because that's what drives us to be somebody. And the paradox is, of course, is the greatest way of being somebody is to be a nobody. So it's astounding when you think about that, you see. <clears throat> and that's what God does, you see. In fact, when you think of it, uh, you know, uh, why did why, why the Bansham say to other Mauritian, on the day that you eat from that tree, you die? Why? All right? So you think it's a punishment. Sounds like it, right? You disobey my word. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, terminate you. And so on, you know? But it's not. What was the Bansham saying to Adam? He said this, you know? You want to eat from that tree, why? Because you want to eat from that tree because you think you can equal me. You want to be God, right? So I'll tell you what. Eat from the tree. If you eat from the tree, guess what? I will allow you to see the effect of thinking you're God, which means I will remove myself from you, right? And guess what happens to you? Dead. Because you are nobody. It was me to connect me the death to Adam was the repercussions or the effect of what he was saying when he ate from the tree. He believed, right, he could be God, so God said, fine, let's see what happens, right? Meanwhile, I'll exit, let's see what happens to you. Are you God or not? Of course not. You die. To me, the connected me, that that's what it was. Because really the repercussions of all sins is the belief that I'm somebody. You see, and by all he said, the repercussion, of course, is death. Because, hey, you said you, God, right? So I'll let you think, and I'll let you try to be it. And of course he can't, and then of course Adam dies. So what we see, therefore, is that the options in Adam were different than our options. But in the, in the end, it's the same thing. It's a contest. But by him, it wasn't so much, it's me or God, you see, because he couldn't fool himself at that point in time. He was created at the sixth day when everything was here. So what can he say he did, you see? But he wanted to strive to be God because he had the existential inferiority, you see. And once he failed, of course, then the world changed and they entered a new period, which is him versus God. It's no longer the tree, you know, and that's the options. And that's the concept of Bezer Sapecho, that what he did is he increased the illusions, made it much more difficult, because now he can only eat if he's a real cause. But he's not a cause at all, really. But he thinks that he's a cause, you see? So that made it much worse uh, for other religions and so on, you know? And in the end, um, there are many things that give a person the illusion of self, which I've mentioned and so on. And I want to tell you something interesting. Chesed. Why is God so much into Chesed? Now, you can say to yourself, because God is kind, right? And when you do chesed to another person, right, what are you really doing? You're helping that person out. It's kindness. But from the framework that I am creating for you, why is chesed so important? Because when you do something for somebody else, you are denying your own importance, mm. aren't you? You see how chesed is part of the plan? Why does one, why does Russian want all clients will to be misachid? To be unified mm -hmm. because he's desperately trying to say to you stop thinking you're somebody mm -hmm. you're really part 
And that's the concept of chesed, you see. Now stop doing things for yourself, you know, because it'll help you if you do chesed to somebody else, it'll help you to deny yourself. Because now you're doing chesed for him. So that diminishes your importance, you see. People who are incredibly arrogant don't do chesed. Because it's all about me. Now you see, you'll always find a correlation here. Uh, so chesed, achters, all of this is where the Bosham is desperately trying to get you. Don't think you're God's gift or whatever you think, and so on. So he's got all kinds of things, the mitzvahs, where you deny your own self-importance. It's an interesting, it's a different way of looking at chesed. Of course, I'm not denying the fact that chesed, you know, God wants to be kind, and so on. But there's a very subtle principle here that people who do chesed, you notice, don't think of much of themselves. It's an automatic. Because when you do chesed for everybody else, automatically you diminish your own importance. It will always happen like that, you see. So that, in many ways, is, is a very important. And ultimately speaking, the real contest is SG. Uh, and I realize it's incredibly difficult. I brought the story of the Baba Sali to show you, you know. I mean, here was a man who was, he was a man that was incredibly spiritual. And you see where he was at, you know, that it took, it's fun now, I mean, it's amazing that even he couldn't succumb to this incredible food that his wife gave, this shampoo, you know. But when he did, when he began to feel self enter the picture, I want to eat it because I want to eat it, it tastes good, right? Immediately, he had the ability to push it away, which is really incredible to think about that, you know? And in the end, that's what it is. <clears throat> Just to think about that is very good. Just to say, you know, I want to do this for God. I'd love to do it. Hey, I'm only a human, and believe me, I got a long way to go, so God, forgive me if 90% goes to me and 10% goes to you. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> And that, that's a very great madrega. In any case, uh, what I've tried to do is bring fundamental understanding of psychology and, 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 and hashkofa and what the human condition is, what the job ultimately really is, what, uh, you, to, what a Jew has to do. And that's Oilam Hapo. Oilam Hapo is to the extent that it's more G than S, that's what you get in Oilam Hapo. The problem is in Oilam Hapo there is no S. You see, it's only G. You see, and uh, that's when we realize that. But in the end, that's what Oilam Haba is. It's a complete relationship with the Vashon based on our behavior of dedicating and, and, and channeling everything for his, 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 uh, his sake. And I wish you and me Hatzlocha in that Avoida. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, wait, wait, one second, one second. Let me go on the, yeah, go ahead, what do you want? Uh, so the person who walks by the restaurant doesn't need to trade. Did he, him, do that? Or was that Hashem? No. Was he the causality of Yes, the... no, he, he had free will. So, so there is a self in as much as there's free will. Well, there's, there is a self because we exist as a self. The question is what do you feel is the significance of yourself? Do you think you really exist like God? Do you really think you can do whatever you want, but you have free will? If you don't want, you don't go to the restaurant. That, that's your free will operating. God did give you an area that he does not cause you to do it. It's a very small area, by the way. You know what the area is? The decision. That's it. You have nothing else. We think we make a decision, and then we do everything else. No. God allows you to make the decision in your mind. After that, it's all God. Because He made that made the decision. It was you that really made the decision. So, so in a sense, there really is a me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Of course, there is. Why does the Torah start with Beis? I'll tell you. Because what the Torah is saying is that in the end, there's always two entities that will always exist: God and the self. There is a self, but that self emanates from God totally in a way we cannot even comprehend, you see? Uh, but there is a concept of self or else how, if there's no self then who's doing the mitzvah? You know what I'm saying? Uh, so there will always be two entities in the Bria, Bays, two. God and 
a self that emanates from God. But the mystery is, how can something emanate from God and still feel it's independent? Nobody knows. That is a mystery of, you know. Mm. Yeah, that. Yeah, what, what do you do if you've had a lot of exposure of people who are self, very um, arrogant, it, you know, you get a variety of these kind of people coming at you on a constant basis. What do you do? They're God, in a sense. What do you do? Yeah, how do you how do you deal with these people on a regular basis? They they, they could be very aggressive uh, for reasons that are uh, simply applied to their own ego. How do you, how do you deal with it in this situation? Well, that's a that's a uh, the best thing. Usually, the best thing to do is to avoid them. But how do you avoid them if you're, uh, they're a neighbor and, and they're very aggressive for reasons that make no sense to you? <laughs> I mean, these are religious people. Uh, you move. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Go ahead. I'd like to know why Chava, after she ate from the tree, I yeah. understood that it was false, then offered the, it to Adam. You want to know why she did it? I want to, what was your motivation? She knew already it was false. Of course. So, okay, why did she then That's why she's... Because, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the reasoning why, because she realized that she was going to, she was dead. She was finished. She ate from the tree, right? So she realized that, wait, you know, what the one she was going to do is he's gonna, she's gone, and he's going to give uh, Adam another wife, obviously. Yeah, no, no, it's what Rashi says. That, 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 that's the message, you know? And she did not want husband, uh, her uh, Adam to have another uh, another woman. That sounds very strange, right? But that was her reasoning, you know. Uh, that's why women have this the punishment, the, you know, the childbirth. To the, they have to the <coughs> for it, uh, part of the kapara what Chava did. Chava sinned grievously. She killed Adam. I realized what she did, and that's why she has to be martyred nearest by Shabbos. Because since she did, she extinguished the flame of the world. She has to open up uh, again the flame, and that's what part of the lighting the candles and Shabbos is. Yeah, Chava did a very bad thing. In effect, she killed Adam. She did more than that. Not only she killed her husband, because obviously he was going to be finished, right? But she destroyed the world. She diminished the entire world to a very low madrega, and we have to suffer because of that. Yeah, what she did was incredible. Uh, but listen. That's a woman. <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, I mean, well, you know, she is the prototype woman. She's the model for every woman that ever existed after that. But listen, let's not get it wrong. Chava was a very great woman. She was. And, you know, look, she got caught up in. You know. What was her greatness if this was if everything you told me was so terrible? Tell me what her greatness was. Adam was a. Adam, before the sin, was a being that we cannot comprehend. He was so great, potentially, in terms of his attributes, that the Malachim thought he was God, and they started singing Shira to him. Believe? It's a madras. Oh yeah, you might just say, oh, it's a madras. I mean, because when God does something, unless the person does not deserve it, then God does the best for that person. I mean, God is capable of making the greatest thing we can ever imagine. And when he made Adam, Adam was incredible. Like I said, even the Malachim thought he was God. But they found that different because Adam said, I'm not the one. And he was rewarded for that, whatever. He said, you know. Uh, and therefore, Chava, when he made Chava, she must have been an incredible woman. But listen, the problem was, they all have human emotions. Even though we don't understand the, the humanity of Adam and Chava before the sin, don't think they were like you and me, not at all. Uh, they were incredible beings, but there had to be room that they could fall, or else what was the point? And they fell, because the desire, well, whatever, you know, w once a person falls, then you have a lot of uh, uh, emotions coming in that a person is trying to defend himself, you know, and obviously, maybe she felt that if, if, uh, if uh, Adam eats from the tree, that God won't kill her, because he's not going to kill her and Adam, so therefore she'll survive and Adam will survive. Okay, it's a demoted state, but at least they'll survive. I mean, it could be a lot of things that she thought about. But listen, shows you one thing. No matter how great you think you are, you can fall. That's what it shows you. Don't, like the Chazal say, 
al tamer biatzmecho. Don't believe in yourself. That's and that's that's a statement you could say. <laughs> Who's next? Yes. Can you comment on this insane law that they passed in New York to oh, yeah, terminate a birth up until nine months now <laughs> without it without it being born? Can you comment on that? Comment on that? Yeah. Can you repeat what he said? <clears throat> um, you want to repeat this? Uh, you need to repeat it. Uh, I, yeah, I heard about this recently. You know, New York State just passed a law that a woman has the right to terminate the birth of a child right up to be given birth. Okay, that, that's, that's a new law. It's astounding. Yeah. Um, the idea is what I think it is, you know. <clears throat> you go back to Egypt, okay. Before the Rabbanisham will punish, he gives the, the individual or whatever all the rope he needs to hang himself. That's what he does. Because there's a certain measure that God waits. You know, he, won't take, he won't exact retribution until the measure has been reached. That's the meat of the version, okay? Or for whatever reason, you know? Uh, what that law does is it legally sanctions murder. It's fundamental ways. Not that before that it wasn't murder. Partial birth abortions is murder, you know. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons I believe why the United States is suffering in many ways, you know, uh, in terms of weather, many different things, because the bunch, because the the Congress, I mean, the presidents or whatever, they're a bunch of murderers. That's really what they are. Uh, but I believe that the Bunchum is allowing them to go to the end, and he's going to wallop them. <clears throat> and uh, it's unfortunate because when he does that, I mean, you know, uh, you remember Katrina? Mm -hmm. Do you know why Katrina happened? Katrina hit New Orleans on Monday, right? It went over the levees on Tuesday and it wiped out the city. Why? Uh, so uh, it was interesting, you know? <clears throat> now, the bad part about it is that the Bersham didn't kill a person. He wiped out the city. That's pretty vicious in the sense that, what a din, wow. What could they have done that deserved the city to be destroyed? And then I realized, because I was on the train, and somebody left a newspaper and, on the seat, and I picked it up, and I read one article, and I, it just blew me away. And that was the answer. Because New Orleans has a holiday once a year. It's called Southern Decadence Day. What is that? And that was going to happen on Wednesday, right? What is that? That means the city of New Orleans, they allow everybody to engage in illegal sexual activity, openly, see? So what happened was, so there, if that's the case, then you're looking at the generation of Noach, right? And what destroyed them? Katrina, which is a mini model. Namash, it's a mini model. That's what destroyed them. So what was interesting in the Russian didn't rock him on that, you know, uh, you know uh, at that point, but he decided that enough is enough, and he wiped out the city. Two days before, so they shouldn't even have that. But obviously they filled their quota of sin and wiped them out. That is very, very, uh, what he called, threatening, <clears throat> because it means that the Xerus are now coming to light, that the Bershom doesn't is not waiting anymore, and he's going to severely punish uh, New York State, uh, and, and so on. He already did that with Sandy. Sandy moved up the coast, you know, and was supposed to avoid New York. It just went into New Jersey, right into New York, and it flooded up to 33rd Street. It was incredible. They're still suffering from Sandy and all that, you know. <clears throat> and what they did, it's astounding, but you're talking about incredibly evil people, and they, they you know, and that's the, their measures being, f uh, is being filled up, and so on, you know. That's what it is, uh, that's what, you know, what you see. Anything else? Yeah. So really what you're saying is that we have to nullify the SG ratio, which in other words is Bitul, right? Bitul. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah it's, well, it's the same. Uh, yeah, okay. Anybody else? What, what if someone doesn't yeah. do an Avera because they don't want to get the Onish? That's 100% S and no G. No, 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 but <clears throat> I want to tell you something. At least they don't do the Avera. Right? That was an accomplishment, you know? The SG is motive and is also the Avera. But you're halfway there, 
if you don't do the Avera. So. But if, you, if you're afraid of the consequence, you're acknowledging Hashem. Exactly. That's called Yerzachit. It's fear of sin. Fear of sin is exactly S. You don't want to get punished. But it's valid. It's a legitimate fear not to do the Avera. And like she, we, we, she said, which is true, you, why are you afraid? Because you believe God exists and that he was gonna, he's going to come after you. There's retribution. So that itself is a, is a source. It's a merit. So that's the G part. Mm -hmm. But you know, a lot of people who sin, or whether they break laws, you know, secular laws, or they sin, they think that they're going to get away with it because they're above the law. Well, yeah, they're, of course. They're, they're admitting there is a law, yeah, but I'll manage to get away yeah. with it. Yeah. You wanted to add something? Anybody else? Well, I, was just, I was just wondering. I think if Who's I got, talking? You, oh, you're talking. If I got yeah. you correct, the what? You, you said we will receive what we invest. Yes. And so I was wondering, because you also mentioned infinite bliss. Yes. And how can I, as a finite human being, invest so much that I will receive infinite bliss? That's, that's a very good question. And the answer is, you can't. Uh, it's, that's the chesed of God. What a God has done is beyond belief, you see? Because you look at the fact, first of all, all you can do the mitzvahs is what? 80, 80 years, 90 years. And like you said, we're talking about an, inf an eternal dimension. You know, it's far more than 90 years. And so on. That, that itself is incredible. The second thing is, you know, big deal. So I put on sitzes. So what? How could this be commensurate with the infinite reward I get? It's not. I see, and not only that, but God actually helps you get Oedem Abba because he does many things that will, he allows you to erase your sin, then he does other things. And the answer is, in the end, that's why Chazal say, Oilam Chesed Yibonah. The world really stands on Chesed because none of this makes sense. It's like a guy showing up to work, he puts in, you know, two weeks sorting mail, right? I mean, let's say he's a clerk in the mail room downstairs, right? He puts in two weeks uh, sorting the mail, and then after two weeks, it comes for his paycheck, and the employee gives him $100 million. Does this make sense? No. Uh, you know? But like, you know, but the smart thing is, hey, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You know? If the Bosham is doing it, I'm okay with it. And that's all. But it's all chesed. It's unbelievable chesed. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Rabbi, I have a question. Uh, I, you, you make a great analysis in law for uh, Adam Mishon and his uh, psychology and behavior. But he was only alone. He's what? He was what? Adam Mishon. He was uh, alone. God, what? He was oh, one. So he could, in his mind, think that, yes, I am God, and, uh, you know, and uh, put an opposite to real God. But uh, soon there are many people. I can't, I can't imagine that everybody, you know, separate, thinks that he is God, you know? It is uh, uh, impossible, like, and then we know, of course, as Jews, we know that he is our creator, yeah. and he is our master, and, and a lot of people, and everybody thinks that he is a God opposing to real God, I, I don't mm. think so, but... No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Let wait, me wait. finish, I did, Important. It's not a matter. Remember, you know, man desires to be omnipotent. Man desires to be omnipotent, right? It's the greatest remedy for being insecure, right? That's what it is, you know. There are people that really act as if they're God. They may not believe it, but they're already acting that way, right? There are people that think they are off the charts, right? Uh, all kinds of. Uh, what do you call approaches to that thought? But there are people like Paroy. Paroy said he was a god, right? Then there are people trying to overthrow God, the whole middle bubble. These guys are trying to overthrow the Rabbi Islam, all right? And then there's other Mauritian who wants to become God. You know, everybody has different degrees of that illusion. <coughs> Some are severe, you know what I'm saying? You remind me of where some guy went into an insane asylum. You know, you, to check it out, right, you know? And then he sees one guy saying, you know, hey, I'm the Messiah. He sees a guy saying, I'm the Messiah, right? So obviously the guy's not all there, right? Then he, he looks over there, he sees the, another guy across the hall in another cell, right? He's laughing. So he makes his way to the, the other guy, and he says, uh, 
He says, why are you laughing? I mean, I, you know, the guy says he thinks of a Never, he's, you know, obviously, he's, what are you laughing? He says, because the guy's crazy. Why? He says, why is he crazy? Maybe he's the Messiah. He says, what are you talking about? I'm God. I didn't make him Messiah. I mean, everybody, <laughs> everybody's got their angle, so to speak. Some people think they're the Messiah. It's called the Jerusalem complex, by the way. You know, as soon as they hit Jerusalem, here I am, guys. You know? Uh, and then, uh, so what I'm really saying is that uh, you're looking at different degrees and angles of that delusion. People tend to think far more of themselves than they really are, you know, and, and it's a matter of degrees, that's all, you know. <clears throat> anyway, that, that, that's the idea. Let me finish my question, sorry. It's oh, okay. Right, it's only here. I, I just approach him. So, so yeah. soon we're talking about Jewish nation, okay? And the soon it is uh, so many Jews. Uh, and uh, you analyze this, uh, what God brought from man? Yes. But what do, nice. what do you want to ask? What do you want to ask? What is it what God brought from Jews? <clears throat> what do you want from the Jews? Right. Jewish people. Yeah. Simple. He wants them to recognize that he exists and that he is the supreme being. In the end, that's all he wants. It's very difficult, like I say, because our needs and drives, you know, force us to want to satisfy what we want and so on. But in the end, that's all he wants. Like I said, Anoichi, the Yasser said, Anoichi Hashem Lokech, I am the Lord your God, that took you out of Egypt. That's the, don't believe in anybody else, but ultimately, Anoichi Hashem Lokech, just believe that I exist and I run the world. You see? Anybody else? Yeah. What were the three again? One was, that's the only existence. Two, he's the only cause. Oh, Yichud, you mean the third? Well, Yichud means you say, Ain't no he's the only thing that exists. Mm -hmm. Two, he's the only force in creation. Right. And the direction of the universe ah. can only go in his way. Right. Even though we have free will. And that's the incredible concept of God. That he can do that. You see? Wow. Anybody else? Yes, <laughs> Oh, we're not.